Howdy everyone, my name is Griffin Furlong. I am a professional engineer in the state of Florida, and in today's video, I'm going to show you what goes into a construction plan set. The goal of this video is to help young aspiring land development engineers understand what goes into a construction plan set and how to read the information. Let's dive right into it. The first place where I want to begin is just introducing the fact that a construction plan set is like reading a story. The story is the whole construction of this project. The project has a few different cycles and usually you can understand the cycle based on this sheet index here right on the cover sheet. So this is the first place that will start. So let's examine what is on a cover sheet. Now typically on a cover sheet you have a project name up here which I've blurred out and I've blurred out applicable information here in the title block. Usually you will see the engineer, the PE, and then the project name as well as the client. What you also may find is the revision block. The revision block will show you how many revisions that has taken place within this construction plan set. Notice here how you have two different location maps. One is more of a high level bird's eye view, typically a very high scale, just showing the general vicinity of the project. The next location map will be a little bit more zoomed in. You also have a site data table that shows you the project location, the section, township, and range the project area, and other applicable information. You'll also have the vertical datums, and this was all based from the survey that we received. But let's actually get to the bread and butter of the cover sheet. The most important part of the cover sheet is definitely the sheet index. This sets the tone for the story of the project. Like I mentioned, a construction plan is a story. The beginning part of construction is everything related to the high level information. What you'll find in the first few sheets are the cover sheet, the general notes, an aerial map, an existing conditions plan, and then the master site plan sheets. How I like to think about this is think of it as the story, and we're gonna use this reference a lot. When a contractor gets this project, there's going to be one activity first, and that will be the actual demolition of any existing features that are on site. Existing features can be existing storm structures, maybe there's an existing building, maybe there's an existing driveway somewhere, or utility poles. There can be a whole bunch of existing features that we will need to remove to actually support the development of the project. Now once the contractor has actually cleared the site and they grubbed it, they've removed any dead trees or any unneeded stuff for the development, after the contractor has removed any unwanted features from the site, typically the first step is doing a very rough grading and that's usually digging the ponds, installing any deep storm structures or deep sanitary structures, and then they can move forward with all the paving. But before we dive too deep, let's get right into what the general notes look like. General notes typically has general construction notes and this is mainly for the contractor to know what they can and can't do. Typical construction note might look like the following. Prior to construction the contractor shall obtain from the engineer or owner a copy of all the pertinent permits related to this project. So again a lot of these are just very general on what they can and cannot do. There's typically notes for paving, grading, drainage, clearing, and there's even a lot of stuff here related to utilities. Believe it or not general notes are very important because we consider this a CYA or a cover your butt uh, language that we put on here so that we are covering our bases as far as what the contract, what the contractor can or can't do related to the code of the municipality. So with construction plan sets, you are trying to get a permit which is typically a construction permit to actually build something. In this case, this is a residential neighborhood where we are trying to build lots and the infrastructure to support those lots. Now that you have a general sense of the cover sheet and general notes, I'm going to skip the next notes. So we got some more notes here. And then now we're on to the aerial map. Now this is very typical for a construction plan to have. There's usually some sort of aerial, just so you can see the existing features of different trees or waterways. And usually what we do is we overlay a site plan over the aerial. A lot of times what the county or municipality may ask for are the neighboring properties and the information of the property owners. Also what you might find are existing wetlands, especially in Florida. So typically what we do is we hire an 
environmental scientists and a surveyor to go out and stake wetlands and to tag all of the trees that are on site that we might remove. Now let's dive into an existing condition plan. So here's an existing condition plan. It's very colorful. It's kind of colorful for my taste, but let's see what type of information is on an existing condition plan. I think the first thing that I want to focus on is this fun little key map up here. A good construction plan set will always have a good key map that lets you know exactly where you are in space. So if I wanted to look at sheet five, I know that I'll be looking at this part of the neighborhood. And if I'm on sheet six, I'll be looking at the eastern half of the neighborhood. Also what you might have on here, it looks like we have some wetland buffer impact legends. I really like a solid legend. Looks like we have different legends for wetland impacts, right of way lines, single row silt fence, and we'll get to that in a minute. What else do we got? We also have a wetland data table that shows all of the wetlands that are on site, their acreage and their category. Now, every municipality is different. It just so happens that wetlands are labeled in a category with this municipality. Now that we walk through a couple of these legends, let's actually dive into what is going on here in plan view. So we have some different colors going on. So let's zoom into this particular area. As we remembered, we looked at that legend over there and this line work here that has kind of circles around it, that's the silt fence. Now this lets the contractor know where their extents of grading and clearing are. So as you can see, we are going to be installing a whole bunch of silt fence around the property. Now it looks like we are showing some wetland impacts due to the grading of the lots and it looks like we have some symbols here that show the different trees that we're removing. Now I know some of you might go, oh no, we're removing all these trees and all that. Well, to make everyone feel better, we usually hire an arborist and a surveyor and a landscape architect to go out and scope all of the existing trees that are on site. Based off environmental code and working with the other consultants, we try to make sure that we save as many trees as possible. And sometimes what you might find is that we'll actually plant more trees. And a lot of times we'll build wetland creation areas. So any sort of wetland that we are impacting will usually have some sort of area where we will mitigate. There's also a way to mitigate for wetlands via wetland mitigation banks, but that is not gonna be explained in this video at all. I just want us to generally understand what goes into an existing conditions plan. Notice here too, you see how it says zone A and zone X. So what we have to show are the FEMA floodplain delineation lines. So according to FEMA, we have some floodplains that are on our site. And if we take a look around, this little black line here with that interesting little line type, that is the delineation of the floodplain. Now, what is a floodplain? The FEMA floodplain line is where we expect water to store to during a 100 year event. So this floodplain here is filling up with water during a 100 year storm event, and that is the delineation of where we expect water to store. Now I will be going on to the other sheet, which is the Eastern half. I'm trying to see if we have any demolition of any existing infrastructure. It doesn't look like it, but this is the place where we will call out any demolition of existing structure. Like I talked about, sometimes you might find pole barns out there. Sometimes you might find RCP. You might find like a little 18 inch RCP pipe out there that you need to take out. It really depends and every project is different. Now what I'll say about an existing conditions and demolition plan is it's very important to know what is out there on site. Because let's say if there were a whole bunch of existing features that weren't surveyed, that's going to be an added cost later. And hopefully before you bid out this work to a contractor, hopefully you're identifying everything that could be a potential potential cost. Now, just to kind of summarize what we've been through so far, again, we got the cover sheet, which pretty much explains what the project is, the project acreage. It lets everyone know who the client is, the developer, engineer, the environmental scientist, the surveyor. Then you have your general notes, which gives you a guideline of what the contractor can and cannot do. And then you have the existing conditions and demolition sheet. Again, this is all of the story of the construction plan set. Now, once the contractor is done clearing and grubbing and removing any unwanted features, it's time to roll into the site plan sheets, which is the actual vision of the project. So let's go to the master site plan sheet. Typically in a master site plan sheet, you will see any sort of lots or buildings. You might have lot numbers. You're going to have your stormwater ponds. Again, this is a residential neighborhood where we are building lots and stormwater infrastructure. So I think the first thing I want to shift focus to are the legends again. This legend, we have a lot count of the project. So this tallies up all of the number of units for the project. So with this project in this phase 1A, we have 179 units. 
Also in the legend are existing wetland areas. You can also see that, you know, we have right of way lines. We got this dash red line here for a construction phase line that lets the contractor know what the phase line is. And then we got our ponds. So now let's take a look in plan view of what is going on here. With site plans, what you do want to showcase is your right of way and any political lines. And what I mean by political lines is political lines to me are ownership of the property. So each of these homeowners eventually will own their lot here. So as you can see, we have some lot numbers and we have lot lines, track lines. You can even see some sidewalk lines. And then we also have all of the different streets named. So this happens to be Castaway Loop. Then you got all of your ponds labeled and it looks like we actually have a lift station in this area. So this is where all of the wastewater is being collected. And this lift station is actually pumping out all of the wastewater back to the wastewater treatment plant. Now with Florida, sometimes what you might see are floodplain compensation ponds. It looks like we have a few on this site and they are denoted by FPC, floodplain compensation. Since this project was heavily in the floodplain, we had to build a lot of floodplain compensation areas for water to store. A unique part about this project too is that at all of our entrances, we had some huge grand oak trees that we wanted to save. So we have to re-site plan to enhance the entrance of this project. Now, keep in mind, this is the master site plan. So it's not gonna have a whole bunch of details, but pretty much it sums up the vision of the project and the high level items that are going into this project, which are lots, ponds, wetlands, road names, you name it. So now that we have a better understanding of a master Master site plan, let's dive into some of the site plan sheets. So here's our first site plan sheet and notice how we're now starting to zoom in. Notice the scale on this guy. We're at a scale of 50 here and that's pretty typical. Sometimes you can see 30, 40, you might even see 60. This is a 50 scale and now we're zooming in to see the finer details of what is going to be built. Let's just go to the entrance here and see what kind of things are called out. And here to the entrance and notice how we have some different line work. It looks like we have some sort of path. Let's see if we can find a call out for this grade hatch line. I already know what it is, but let's see if we can identify what this is. This is a 12 foot multi-use trail. So this is pretty much just a big paved pathway right here for people to ride their bikes, to walk. This definitely gives them some good space to pretty much walk around and, and view this wetland and the different trees. One thing I'll say about reading construction plans, and this is just a general tip, is that follow the lines because things will always be called out. And just for your future knowledge, you know, as you're an EI or maybe you're someone new to the land development industry, you know, as you're going through plan sets, you should have some sort of legend that highlights what something is or a leader pointing to the exact line there. So for instance, you know, I know that this is a sidewalk catch. Whenever we say the word typical, that just means that instead of labeling this a million times, if we just say typical, that means that's typically what it's going to be. So if I'm pointing to that sidewalk, well, sure enough, that's gonna be sidewalk throughout this whole plan here. Another thing I want you guys to notice is look at some of these dimensions. The contractor and everyone has to know what these are dimensioned out to be. This is a 100 foot right of way. What a right of way means is that this is the right of way for people and cars to travel through. This right of way actually happens to be a private road, which means that county or the municipality is not going to be owning and maintaining this right-of-way here. Since this right-of-way is private, this will actually be maintained and operated by an HOA or a CDD. Now, HOA, as we all might know, is the Homeowners Association, and a CDD is a Community Development District. Think of these as just little governments where they collect money and they're able to maintain the existing infrastructure that's on the site. Now, if the HOA and CDD owns this right-of-way, that means that they're owning and maintaining all of these multi-use paths, the roads, the curbs, and even the stormwater infrastructure. I know a lot of people like to complain about the HOA fees, but this is what your money is going into. Now, a site plan is not a utility plan and it's not a drainage plan. Notice how I have no details here about you know, where water is draining or we, and we definitely can't see any sort of utilities. Again, a site plan is just very general, showing dimensions, applicable call outs like the lot numbers, dimensions here for the lots, any sort of ADA crosswalks, sidewalks, 
We even have some pond geometry right here showcasing where the top of bank is and the normal water. A site plan pretty much is showing everything that's above ground. Now let's see if we can find any more fun things on the site plan. It looks like we have a huge bridge right here, which is pretty cool. Now it looks like in this site plan we have a huge bridge right here, and we did not design this bridge, but we actually had to work with a bridge designer, and that's why on this site plan we said proposed bridge refer to plan by others, separate permit required. A lot of times we will do this when we're doing a big structural piece or component, for instance walls, bridges, handrails, all of that stuff. Us as the land development engineers have to have a general sense of what needs to be installed, but concurrently we're working with a structural engineer to make sure they have the components for them to do their job. So it's not uncommon here with any sort of structural component to say separate permit required or refer to another plan set. Now what I want to remind everyone is that this is part one of the series. So I really just wanted to introduce the first basic building blocks of a construction plan set, which is from cover sheets, existing conditions, Conditions, the general notes, the aerial, and then the site plan sheets. Tune into the next video to dive more into the paving, grading, and drainage plans and the utility plans. And then in part three, we will go through the plan and profiles. That's all I have for today, guys. I really hope you learned something new. And if you need any additional clarification, please comment below. And if you're interested in learning anything about the land development industry, please comment below and tell me what topics you are interested in. I've also set up a booking service on my YouTube channel and my website to allow anyone to ask me questions. Feel free to check that out. And again, I just really appreciate everyone tuning in and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.